Good morning, friends, and welcome to church at St. Andrew's Cathedral this morning. It is a pleasure to have you in our cathedral as we worship Christ together. In scripture, Jesus answered the people, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Would you please stand and let's join others this day in praising our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Would you please be seated? And I noticed, indeed, uh, so movingly really in the second last verse there, we were invited as we gather today to adopt the posture of Mary of Bethany, to sit at the feet of Jesus and to listen, ready to respond in service. Welcome again to the cathedral. Uh, it's lovely. I love seeing you who worship here regularly gather week by week. It's so good to see your faces, but it's also always delightful to have so many visitors from around our state and nation and across the world indeed. Thank you for coming today. Uh, Chris, our sub-dean, is on annual leave and so pray for his refreshment with Sandra, his wife. And Jonathan, our new assistant minister, 
is providing emergency relief at St John's Darlinghurst, our parish just neighbouring to the east. Their rector is very newly joined the school council of Cranbrook and if you've been in Sydney following the news you'll know they've had a bit of work to do. I was told that he'd had 40 hours worth of unscheduled board meetings in the last 10 days and so Jonathan is lending a hand uh, with the Ministry of the Word at Darlinghurst today. Uh, we don't normally do this but it is important I think on this occasion to welcome Mrs Oza, the widow of our late organ Michael Hemans uh, who died here in the 1980, uh, who is with us in her 90th year visiting today. But we are glad to have all of you who are visiting with us. Shall we now humble ourselves before God on page four and bow in prayer together? Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Lord, have mercy on us and write your commandments in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We beseech you, almighty God, to look in mercy on your people, that by your great goodness, they may be governed and preserved evermore through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you've made and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
taster of why you might wish to join us on Good Friday evening for the whole of the performance of Handel's Messiah. The details are there with the Easter uh, service details. It's now time for our children to leave for the Cathedral Kids Sunday School. And if you're here with your kids, you may take them to the rear of the cathedral where our teachers will meet them and uh, they'll head downstairs. They return to the family zone after the service for morning tea at the same time as we share uh, our own refreshments. Let us now turn our attention to the Word of God. Good morning. Our Old Testament Bible reading for today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 22, starting at the 29th verse. Do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats. You must give me the firstborn of your sons. Do the same with your cattle and your sheep. Let them stay with their mothers for seven days, but give them to me on the eighth day. You are to be my holy people. So do not eat the meat of an animal torn by wild beasts. Throw it to the dogs. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd and do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe for a bribe blinds those who see and twist the words of the innocent. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. The New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, starting from chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. 
They discussed with this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm very grateful that Adrian will be returning in a moment to unfold that gospel reading for us as we continue through Mark. But would you now stand and with me and in fellowship with Christians around the world, let us confess our common faith together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, what is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Would you please join me in prayer as we ask for God's help? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed the light of the gospel through the word of your Son. Please help us now by the help of your Spirit to hear your voice. And please help me speak clearly and faithfully so that we may grow as followers of the Lord Jesus in our love and knowledge of him. In his name we pray. Amen. Do you remember a few years ago when supermarket aisles were empty and it was hard to get even household supplies? Panic buying sparked this great sense of need. When will new supplies arrive, new provisions? Thankfully, those days seem past. Yet from time to time, perhaps more seriously, you might find yourself in a time of need, a season that weighs heavily on your heart. When tragedy strikes, where do you turn? The pressures of personal illness or that of loved ones, relational stress, a difficult time at work or home, and not many people to lean on or a shoulder to cry on, or tightening budgets. This might leave one feeling depleted or exhausted, pushed to the limit, and left wondering, how will I get through? Where do I turn? Who can I depend on? And where can I find safe harbor when life is hard? At the start of today's passage, a crowd had sought Jesus, and Jesus sees their need. We're told from the end of chapter seven, after the healing of the deaf man, they were overwhelmed with amazement. Jesus had healed, taught, driven out demons, all with authority. He saw the need and he provided. And today we see in this second feeding miracle, his provision. We might wonder why again? 
But the big question that Jesus asks at the end in verse 21 of this section is, do you still not understand? If you like to take notes, we look at three scenes today on the bottom of, on page eight. Firstly, Jesus' compassion to the crowd, verses one to 10, followed by his confrontation with the Pharisees. And then we see how he continues on with the disciples. In these scenes, we think about need and provision. So let's take a look at our first point. We see the need, Jesus sees the need. We're told that the crowd had been there for a few days and perhaps they'd run out of food. Jesus sees the need and he meets it. We get a glimpse into his heart, reading, since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. The word compassion might remind you of the end of, of, of chapter six, when he first sees that crowd and has compassion on them. They were like a sheep without a shepherd. So he teaches them. This time his heart goes out to them for their physical needs. He also foresees potential danger. Now it's probably less likely for us today to run out of bread. Um, with so much more processed foods as well. But however, one thing that I've come close to running out of is petrol. On some longer drives in the country, I've seen myself in a few situations where I've underestimated how much was in the tank. The light suddenly turns on. My heart beats faster. My foot gets lighter on the accelerator and I let the car glide down to the hill to wonder if I'll actually make it. Jesus knows when our petrol gauge is low. Jesus knows the need. He's moved to compassion to those who've been with him, and he does something about it. But how? His disciples give us a sense of uncertainty and doubt. They answer, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? There's no bakery or corner store or petrol stop. Had they forgotten what Jesus did before in the first feeding? When we read through Mark 6, Dean Sandy Grant helped us turn our eyes to wilderness rest and reminded us of parallels to Psalm 23 where the Lord is our shepherd who makes people lie down in pastures green and provides. In Mark 8 today, we see the disciples' forgetfulness we see their doubt. And Psalm 78 actually might help us reflect on that common experience of the disciples to Israel. Israel as God's chosen people had also doubted and forgotten God's provision. In Psalm 78 verse 19 it reads, they spoke against God, they said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? And in Mark 8, Jesus shows again his disciples that in fact he does and he has. After unfolding the details and the process of having people sit down, giving thanks, taking the loaves, asking, distributing, to, distributing it to the people, we see the result in verse eight. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. We see that Jesus meets the need the people are satisfied and his provision is more than enough. But why does Mark tell this to us again? And why is Jesus repeating the second miracle? Perhaps there are a few reasons. We see that the disciples like Israel failed to see and understand that Jesus provides. Perhaps it's to show that this mission he's on is for Jews as well as Gentiles, given that they're now in Gentile territory and also Hey, the disciples, you have a part to distribute, to play in Jesus' team. Yet despite some differences to the first miracle, there's a big picture here that Jesus provides. He provides and he's on mission to those who turn to him. Yet what about us in our needs? Where do we turn? We see Jesus has compassion and he sees the need. Do you believe that? 
that he cares, that he has compassion and satisfies those who go to him. Be reminded that God knows our needs, that he gives what he needs, even before they ask and more than enough. Can we be content in our creator, knowing that he provides? In a world that constantly hungers and thirsts for many things, that can be tricky, we feel a pull. Yet whether one is in the crowd today or a follower of Jesus, will we be content knowing that he cares, that he knows, that he provides? He's the one who gives strength and sustains. In our next section, we see that whilst Jesus provides, he doesn't necessarily provide for all requests or approve all requests. Jesus demisses the crowd and the next stop is in the region of Damanutha. It's on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, a place where people call Magdalene. He's aware now of those who oppose him, which we now see in this interaction with the Pharisees. So this brings us to our next point, verses 11 to 13, his confrontation. The Pharisees are the traditional gatekeepers um, of Judaism, experts and teachers of the law. They'd been brushes with them already and uh, they'd questioned his authority. They were concerned about morality, about being righteous, about being religiously pure and didn't understand who Jesus was and what he did. The miracles, the healings, now this feeding. So they questioned him and we see to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. They asked him, but it was not a gentle request to seek understanding or to seek assurance. It was fierce and confrontational. To capture the range, other Bible translations say, they, he began to argue. It was a question, but it was more like a dispute, debate. We read on to test him, they asked for a sign from heaven. And again, some would say it's demanding of a sign from heaven. The Pharisees want a sign from heaven, like the Old Testament times where there's an approval of God's presence, or perhaps today we sign things to show our identity. However, rather than seeking assurance, it shows a refusal to believe. It shows this is what they want, to ID check Jesus. And as such, he sighs deeply. First, we've seen him move to compassion. Now he deeply groans because of the Pharisees and the wicked generation before him. His heart sinks. Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to us. Those who are meant to be God's leaders, the religious people that so set in their ways and missing the point, the generations of Israel, the wilderness, the rebellion. God is grieved. Today, how might people ask for signs from heaven? If God would only do this, then I'd believe. If God would only show me his ID card, I'd consent. If only God would. Sometimes people ask questions, but we wonder if, are they truly seeking God or is it intended to lead to more understanding or does it affirm their distance like a stalling mechanism so they just continue doing what they want to do, living life their way in their heritage or whatever it is, rather than coming before God in reverence and fear. It shows a hard heart. Groaning at this establishment that failed in its responsibility, it moves God's heart to groan. Whilst Jesus meets the need, he doesn't necessarily approve all requests. He's not a universal yes man. He's grieved. He can't accept them based on their approach. No sign will be given. He answers according to what he knows best. And so he leaves, but he doesn't leave it at that, thankfully. In the final point, we see that he continues on. Jesus continues on to work out his plan to provide for the disciples. He not only provides bread as we've seen, but he provides reasons to believe. We see this first by the warning of his disciples against the yeast, and then by continuing to ask them questions, and he doesn't give up on them. So the scene changes, and if you take a look in verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, 
except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. And suddenly, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. This meaning comes across stronger than a gentle caution. It's a command and an order. The force of it is what they need to take heed to. Like a parent speaking to their teenager, it's probably a stern word. You could feel it in the voice. You could see it in the eyes. Can you imagine that tone? Yeast is a leaven that ferments, uh, causing dough to rise. In rabbinic literature, yeast is a metaphor that frequently refers to the intention or the attitude of the heart, and it's quite commonly associated with corruption, unholiness, and danger. During lockdown, the yeast, sourdough making, the yeast works its way through the dough to allow the bread to rise. Jesus here warns against the corrupting influence and the attitude of both the Pharisees and of Herod. These are two somewhat separate groups, opposing groups actually, but clumped together. In chapter 3, we've seen that they planned actually, and they conspired to how they'd kill Jesus. And here, first Jesus warns against the religious leaders of the time, of their self-righteousness, their dependence on the law, moralism, And then he warns against the political leaders, those who focused on earthly power and security and neglected the kingdom of heaven. As the disciples discussed with one another the point that they had no bread, perhaps they were wondering, whose fault was it that forgot to bring the bread? We see that Jesus is aware. Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Why are you talking about Um, Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Don't you remember? He goes into this sequence of questions, asking them about their perception, about their eyes, about their hearing, about their hearts. Are your hearts hardened? These words echo that in the Old Testament scriptures that we see the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah mention for God's judgment of rebellious ways. In Jeremiah, the context actually suits our passage particularly well today. God is described as the one who rules over the seas. I'm going to read from Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21, and let's hear this. Hear this, you foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear, Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier. It cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They've turned aside and gone away. As Jesus says this, he is on the boat. The waves are rolling. And he echoes these words of the prophet. Yet in Jeremiah, we see him talking about God. Jesus points to himself as the one who is God. Just like how Jesus is the one who spreads the table in the wilderness, as they traverse the waters another time, they've seen him still the storms, they've seen him walk on water, and he asks them more questions. The first feeding of the 5,000, they know in some sense Yes, there was 12 basketfuls of bread. There were seven loaves for the 4,000. They answer the right questions, but they don't quite get it. The information is there. It's on the page. The dots are there. But can they connect it and see the full picture? They have the data, but can they interpret it? Do you still not understand? We see that Jesus provides He provides by warning, and he provides by giving reasons to believe. After all he's done, all these miracles and teaching, he still has to ask his disciples, do you still not understand? Might you identify with anyone in this account? Like the disciples who've been with Jesus, you've been coming to church perhaps for some time, even involved in in some sort of Christian activity, able to recount and tell stories about what Jesus has done. 
but the yeast of the Pharisees on, and of Herod might hold your attention. Your attitudes of testing in self-righteousness or clinging on to earthly power and security. And in all that, could you miss Jesus' provision? Yet we all need reminding, like the disciples, that Jesus provides. We are creatures that think we are self-sufficient. We think we can do it on our own. Yet we actually depend on him for our life and every breath, for our daily bread. Yet also, we depend on him for our problem that's in common with Israel and the disciples and the crowds, whether Jew or Gentile, our problem of sin. The problem we share with the Pharisees and Herod, the yeast that says, I'm self-sufficient, whether it's self-righteousness or self-determination, the outworkings of sin in our hearts. Our greatest problem, a broken relationship with God, is restored and forgiven through trusting in the gift of his son, seen in his death and resurrection. Not only providing physical bread, not only providing warning or reasons to believe, but ultimately by providing himself. At the beginning of Mark's gospel in chapter one, verse 15, we're told the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is at, is near, has come. Repent and believe the good news. The apostle Paul in Romans also reminds us, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience? Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Repentance means doing this U-turn in our lives from trusting in ourselves to trusting in the Lord Jesus as Savior. As we approach the season of Easter, in the season of Lent, we remember our sin, but we also look to God's provision in our Lord Jesus. Friends, if you hear his voice today, don't delay. One of the remarkable things we see in this passage is God's compassion for those who seek him and not signs. We see his patience. In times of need, where do we turn for, self, for, for safe harbor? Jesus asks his disciples, do you still not understand? How will we respond to Jesus' voice today? May God give us, no matter what season, in need or plenty, the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the soft hearts to know that he provides. The provision for life is not about self-sufficiency, but in the gift of his son, seen in compassion, continues on steadfast love, and ultimately gave himself for us. Amen. Thank you, Adrian. Would you stand with me for our next hymn, which amongst a number of the images for Christ explores Jesus as the bread of life. Please stand.
Friends, you may be seated. And as we anticipate that great day, we turn to our Lord in prayer now. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us as our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God of the nations, your kingdom rules over all. Have mercy on our broken and divided world. We ask you to bless the royal family, particularly King Charles and Princess Catherine in their recovery from illness. And we commit to your providential overruling all those with governance responsibilities in our nation and among our own Christian fellowship. We pray for the federal and New South Wales parliaments as they consider difficult legislative issues, including the recently introduced conversion practices bill in our state and for matters of indigenous welfare, environmental stewardship, energy security, cost of living pressures, defence matters, and so much more. And we pray for the leadership of Anglican schools as they deal with challenging issues, especially just now for the Council of Cranbrook School. And for our own cathedral chapter, with significant heritage, ministry matters, and as we prepare for our AGM in May. We pray too for the Archbishop and Standing Committee as they serve our parishes with policy development for the strengthening of churches and the spread of the gospel. Grant to all these leaders wisdom and discernment, honesty and respect for truth, humility and intellectual integrity, and provide sufficient energy and resilience in their demanding tasks. Our mighty God, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. We pray for Anglican AIDS partner Bible colleges around the world, especially in Madagascar, where there is thirst for your word, but most churches lack a trained pastor. Please help those who teach the Bible in these colleges to correctly handle the word of truth and enable them to be godly examples living lives worthy of you. As students in the colleges study your word, give them the spirit of wisdom so they know you better. Make their love abound more in knowledge and depth of insight so they can discern what's best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Heavenly Father, in this Islamic month of Ramadan, we pray that as Muslims attempt to worship, that you might make known to them you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We pray that as they fast and their bodies hunger and tongues thirst, that you would show them that whoever comes to Jesus will not hunger, and he who believes in him will never thirst. Help them and us to see the insufficiency of our works and lead us all to hunger and thirst for the righteousness that only Jesus can give. <coughs> Father, we pray that you'd give your church love for Muslim people across the world. Make us like Jesus with compassion for sheep without a shepherd. And give your church opportunity and courage to proclaim the gospel to all who desperately need your grace in our city and beyond. God, you are the creator and preserver of all mankind. And so we commend to your fatherly goodness all who are in any way afflicted or distressed or in lack, especially those whom we pause to name silently before you now. And we ask that it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their needs giving them patience in their sufferings, a happy issue out of all their afflictions, and a renewed trust in you as their sustainer. All this we ask by the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, we who come to receive the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ can come only because of his great love for us. For although we're completely undeserving of his love, yet in order to raise us from the darkness of death to everlasting life as God's sons and daughters, our Saviour Christ humbled himself to share our life and to die for us on the cross. In remembrance of his death and as a pledge of his love, he's instituted this holy sacrament which we're now to share. But those who eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and amend their lives. They must come with a repentant heart and steadfast faith. Above all, they must give thanks to God for his love toward us in Christ Jesus. You then who truly repent of your sins and are reconciled with others, intending to lead a new life of joyful obedience to God, I encourage you, draw near with faith and take the Holy Sacrament to strengthen and sustain you. But first, let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you made all things and you call everyone to account. We shame we confess the sins we have committed against you in thought, word and deed. We rightly deserve your condemnation. We turn from our sins and are truly sorry for them. They are a burden we cannot bear. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all that has passed. Enable us to serve and please you in newness of life, to your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has promised to forgive the sins of all who turn to him with repentance and faith, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, strengthen you to do his will and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear these words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. Jesus said, Come to me all who, lab uh, all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. The Apostle John said, If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins. So lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Always and everywhere it is right for us to praise you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator and eternal God. Therefore, with all those gathered round your throne in heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name in words of never-ending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, Lord Most High. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your many and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We thank you, our Father, that in your love and mercy you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our salvation. By this offering of himself once and for all time, Jesus made a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and commanded us to continue a remembrance of his precious death until his coming again. So hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may be partakers of his body and blood. Amen. I remind you from the scriptures that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after the meal, Jesus took the cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. 
you'll see the notes there, uh, the bread and the choice of uh, the drink. Uh, the key thing is to follow the directions of our ushers, but broadly speaking, there are two single file queues, one for each of the main blocks down the centre, coming towards the front. When you've eaten, then to the side that you're on, where you'll be served the drink. If you're in the side aisles, you move to the rear of the cathedral, where once again you'll be served bread and the wine or juice in turn. And those sitting upstairs will come down and likewise be served in one of the corners. Uh, those in the main body sitting towards the back may be asked to head to the back if it's quicker for you to be served there rather than at the front. Follow the ushers and it should be okay. If there's someone who has a mobility issue and can't get to us, please let one of the ushers know and uh, our servers will come to you. Thank you.
we just serve the choir, and my encouragement to you is um, you may just think of people who you're concerned for that you could just pray in this extra moment. lead in prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, in your loving kindness accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the merits and death of your Son Jesus Christ and through faith in his blood that we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his suffering. With gratitude for all your mercies we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Regulars uh, may well have heard of the Dean's Run, a little effort uh, to get people out and moving and maybe a little fitter. Uh, we've moved it from the second to the fourth Saturday of the month, mainly because of a diary clash that the Dean had. Uh, and uh, we meet at 7 a.m. That's this coming Saturday, the fourth Saturday of the month. Circular Quay, wharf number two, where we walk or run. There are people who favour the walk. Uh, 20 minutes, we turn wherever far, however far we get through the gardens, for example. Retrace our steps and have a coffee together at the end. You'd be very welcome. It's a great way to start the weekend and get to know others in the cathedral community. You will see on the uh, back page of your bulletin uh, the Easter advertising. All our services are listed there. But you also notice there's a postcard included in your bulletin separately. And you might think, well, why do we need it twice? And of course, the answer is that the postcard is not so much for you to keep, but to prompt you to pray for whom you might be inviting to church across Easter. If you live or work in the city, could you invite a colleague to that little half hour morning prayer service any day of Holy Week leading up to Good Friday? Or were you interested in uh, the music of the Messiah and you could think there are friends you could invite for a cultural angle at Easter, which in the word sung yet proclaims the gospel. Uh, there are communion services on Maundy Thursday and all day 
Easter Day. The sticklers will notice it says Easter Sunday. I know that's not the correct title, but for the general world, they don't realise if you don't put Sunday in there. So Easter Day. Uh, and then perhaps the highlight of the Christian calendar, Good Friday, where all together at the one time slot, all the cathedral congregations are encouraged to honour Christ who died for us. Can you be praying about whom you might invite along to church this Easter? Uh, lastly, and I won't say uh, much about it just now, but there is a um, not insignificant opportunity to testify to Christ uh, with respect uh, to Muslim folk uh, this Friday uh, in association with the cathedral in the evening. And if you're uh, interested in that in some way, you might contact me. My email address is inside the front cover. That's my direct email. And uh, it, it, it's a not insignificant testimony uh, that I'm looking to offer. Um, you could email me if you want more information about that. Let's, uh, I remind you that morning tea, cuppa, and uh, maybe something to nibble on, serve to your left past the pulpit and behind the choir pews after the service. And we hope many of you can stay, continue in fellowship that way. Let's now stand and sing the wonderful promise of the Lord Jesus, the promise of rest eternal rest. Now, friends, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.